that's that's okay, Angie, because I remember I picked up our Charlie one time uh, for some event she was involved in, and it must have been youth group, and I, we were driving back to Newport, and I didn't talk to her the whole way. I'm just driving along, and uh, we got to Newport, and she said something. I'm like, I forgot you were in the car, so... <laughs> We did. <laughs> well, yeah, Mikey and Tia, you guys abandon your children. There you go. Well, you qualified. Uh, you know, I'm just saying. We were. <laughs> Which just proves the point. The more you neglected her, the better off she was. Wow. Um, you know, they were talking about you guys, your accidents, and Michaela was filling everyone in. And, uh, you know, mom got in a wreck, Ashton got in a wreck. What I got out of that is uh, I'm never riding anywhere with you people. You're awful drivers. So there, that's what I think about that. Right? See? That's not proof of, yeah. I hope you know what's wrong with that statement. We're good drivers because we survived nine accidents. There's so many things that, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but. Um, today, we're at that part, you know, we've been working through our way through the, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, and which I think we could successfully argue that the Sermon on the Mount has to be the greatest sermon ever preached because it was preached by God himself, right? And, and so I just, I every time I go through the Sermon on the Mount, I kind of enjoy that because uh, you think about, well, what does God think about things? And you've got three chapters of him, of the Lord Jesus Christ, telling you what he thinks about different stuff. And, and so I hope you're enjoying that as much as I am. And, and I also hope that if you're not, you don't tell me. But, uh, oh, by the way, cor the corny joke thing. So I have to ask, how many people did not get the two worm thing? It's okay. I know of two people, at least. Okay, there were people there like, I didn't, what was that? The animals went in the ark, so Noah only had two worms. Okay, it's still a bad joke, but at least you know what it means now. Uh, so let's see. We're at that spot in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to try to get to the sermon now because I'm a little distracted. We're at that spot in the Sermon on the Mount that talks about uh, entering through the narrow gate and that, that place where the Lord says the, narrow, the, the way to life is narrow and the way to death is destruction. Many find destruction, few find the narrow gate. We're at that place in Matthew 7. And, and I want to look at that. And as we look at it, what's interesting in the context, because Jesus has been talking about prayer and, and, and the golden rule, we, we looked at that, and then he goes... And he starts a new subject by saying, enter through the narrow gate. And, and after he talks about the narrow gate, he gives us, and we're going it, to, it's good for three weeks. So we, we're, we're, he gives us three examples of, of that comparison between the broad and the narrow gate. And we'll look at those, but we're, we're only looking at one example today. And, and so... Uh, we want to consider that because I think if you fail to consider this passage in context, then you, you might only come up with one interpretation, one un aspect of understanding it. But I think there's a context here in, in Matthew 7 that enlightens us in regards to the Lord's concerns for what the church is going to be dealing with in the last days. And, and I think we, we can think in those terms when Paul writes things like, 
you know, in the last days, perilous times will come, and it's not quite, but almost 2,000 years since he wrote that. We can, I think we can look around us seeing so many of those things come to pass and say, perilous times are here. And, and because of that, we want to begin to think about what are some of the warnings that the Lord issues um, to keep us safe? Because, uh, again, you know, Peter wrote, your enemy, the devil, roams the earth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right? And it's also in that, that context that he says, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, don't let your brain just wander wherever it wants to, but be careful because Satan wants to destroy you. And, and, uh, and I want us to think in those terms and, and I, dealing with that question, how do you look to your soul in these last days? You know, the Bible says in the Psalms, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. How do you guard your heart in, d- in days like this? And, and I believe it's by, by following closely to the Scriptures and looking neither to the right nor to the left in that regard. Uh, and so we want to look at that in the context. And, and immediately after this, he says, enter the narrow gate. We're going to read it. Then he warns of false prophets. And so that's what we're talking about today. That's one of the examples. And um, I believe this is of increasing concern to us these days because um, as I see it from the Scripture there are going to be more and more false prophets as the day of the Lord is approaching. And so let's just start Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we'll be in verse 13, and I'll read down through, well, let's see. It looks like I'm going to read down through verse 20. And it, beginning with this, it says, Enter the, through the narrow gate, because the gate and road that lead to destruction are wide. Many enter through the wide gate. But the narrow gate and the road that lead to life are full of trouble. Only a few people find the narrow gate. Beware of false prophets. They come to you disguised as sheep, but in their hearts they are vicious wolves. You will know them by what they produce. People don't pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, do they? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a rotten tree produces bad fruit. Good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a rotten tree cannot produce good fruit. Any tree that fails to produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into a fire, so you will know them by what they produce. So as we look at that, uh, you know, and, and uh, you could, when we look at this passage, you could say, oh, yeah, well, we already know that Charles doesn't think much of prophecy. That's not true. I don't think much of false prophecy. All right? I think prophecy is something that God does. And I think false prophecy is something people claim to have when they really don't have it. And, and I don't think the two should be put in the same category. But we're not talking about what I think this morning. We're talking about the warnings of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and what he thinks and that's what matters. I, I'm not here to tell you what I think. I'm here to tell you what Scripture says. And that if we ignore it, we are putting ourselves in a dangerous situation. And uh, I'm a church historian, and so back in the 1500s, we finalized an event that known as the Great Reformation. And, you know, people hear that word thrown around. They don't really know what it means, but... Uh, it started with a, a priest, Martin Luther, who was leading his church in Wittenberg, and he had 95 issues with the health of his local church that he was leading and teaching, and he listed those. Those were his theses, things that he thought weren't scriptural that the church was involved in, which created uh, quite an upheaval, uh, be, and, and, and with that there was what we call Reformation. And we call it that because Martin Luther never intended to divide the church. It was only the Catholic Church at the time. He never once wanted to divide the church. He wanted to reform the church. And, and uh, in the process, it did get divided, and we had what we called the Great Reformation, and, and Protestants emerged out of that Reformation. That would be us. Non-Catholics came out of the Reformation. And they had five tenets that were very important to him. In Latin, they're called the sola. And, and of course, that means only in English, of course. And, 
and I'm not going to get into the five sola of the Reformation, but um, one of them I'll mention, and, and it was an important factor, and it was sola scriptura, which meant only scripture has the authority that we need over the minds of men. And, and as Protestants, we have held to that belief that all scripture is God-breathed. Right, and, and you can read that in, T- in Timothy 3 where he says all scripture is given by inspiration. right? A- a- and when we think of that, it uses this word in the original language, theopneustos, God breathed. And, and, I, and I submit to you that we still hold to that belief that only scripture has the authority to, d- to judge and determine what, what, the minds, what goes on in the minds of men. And, and I say that because I was in a... I, I remember, remember a setting where uh, it came up in a meeting somewhere and, and, a, and a gentleman, not myself, uh, another gentleman said, you guys aren't even honoring the solo scriptura. And, and uh, the leader or the meeting said, well, we're not a solo scriptura movement because we believe in prophecy. And I thought, what a horrible point of view because prophecy is something that scripture, first of all, approves of and then determines whether it's accurate. And, and if we start dismissing the authority of Scripture to do what is right in our own minds, we are no better off than those in the book of Judges who each man did what was right in his own sight. And that's not God's plan for the church. And so it, true God-inspired proclamation is part of the narrow path through the narrow gate. In fact, if you were to say, Charles, do you believe in prophetically uttered words from God? I would say that I've been doing that here every Sunday morning for the last four decades. Well, three decades here, four decades in Toledo, Oregon. Yes, I do. Do I believe everybody falls into a category where they're hearing from God? No, I don't. I think the narrow path hears from the Lord. In all fairness. And Jesus said, few find it. And we see this as a reality in Scripture. If we look at the Old Testament and we consider how many prophets there were compared to how many people there were prophesying, there's there's quite a discrepancy in number. That if you look and note that there were a few actual prophets in Scripture that were honored as prophets by the Lord God himself that were part of the contribution of Scripture itself. And there were schools of prophets. There were many prophets. There were, there, you remember the story of the one prophet that came in and he was sent to Israel and, and to prophesy over him. And God said, when you go, don't, don't leave the country the same way that you came in it, and don't have dinner with anyone, and don't go to anyone's house, and then go prophesy this destruction over the kingdom. And he did that. And as he was leaving, an old gentleman shows up on his way out of town, out of the area, and says, hey, I'm a prophet too. You remember that story? And and I'm a prophet too, and God said you should come to my house. Now, The one I really blame is the person that heard from God in the first place and knew God's voice and trusted someone else. So the the actual prophet goes to the false prophet's house. How do we know he was a false prophet? Because he lied. Goes to his house, eats dinner with him, and as he's leaving, he gets attacked by a lion and is killed. So the old false prophet goes out to get the man and says, hmm, he should listen to God. That's what happened, right? You've read this. That's what took place. He, that guy should have listened to God instead of me. You, it makes you wish you were there so you, just so you could smack the guy. We know that other story. It's in 1 Kings chapter 22. It's the story of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and they're going to go to war, and Jehoshaphat says, well, let's inquire of God. And so Ahab brings in his entourage of prophets, and they all start prophesying what a great victory Ahab's going to have. And one of them even has props. 
he 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 went all out that that one right he made iron horns of iron and put them on his head and he he theatrically acted it out with these horns you will gore the enemy and 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 it was quite the show and the bible says but Jehoshaphat was honored of the lord because he walked with god and the man that walked with god saw this and said to Ahab don't you have any real prophets I see this group. Do you have anyone who actually speaks the voice of the Lord? And Ahab says, got one guy, but he doesn't ever have anything good to say about me. (laughs) Right? Where do they keep him? Jail. And, uh, he comes out and says, the Lord showed me what would happen. There'd be a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets, and they would try to get Ahab to go to war and all of this. And the guy with the prop walks over and slaps Micaiah up against the side of the face and says, when did the spirit of the Lord leave me and come to you? There's a lot of that stuff went on in the Old Testament, and I don't believe people today pay attention to it because there's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on today. And people don't know it's wrong. And Jesus warns us that in the last days there will be many false prophets. So if you think, here in Matthew 7, Jesus is intimating that that, uh, false prophets aren't part of the narrow path. But you go to Matthew 24 and he openly condemns them as a problem in the last days. And, And I'll just read one verse out of that for you. It says this, Matthew 24, 11. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Now, Jesus, throughout Matthew 24, if you've read it, you know this. Jesus is talking about the last days, what's going to happen just before his return. And he says, just before my return, there will be many false prophets deceiving many people. That's the broad path of destruction, folks. How many know what the word many means? Yeah, that's the majority of people. It's not the minority. Many is more than few. And and as we look at, if we just think about what that logically says, in any other context, we would get it. Jesus is intimating and telling us, actually, he's not even intimating it. He's telling us plainly, the majority of prophets available in the last days will be false. And the majority of the people in the last days will be deceived by them. That's what Jesus said. Now, either he was right or all these other people are right. I'm going to go with Jesus. And, and, And so as we look at this, and we've talked about the quantity and what that represents. And here we see that Jesus suggested it in Matthew 7, but he openly proclaims it in 24. False prophets are part of the broad path of destruction. And I'm going to tell you why. Satan doesn't need to go to great lengths to deceive the people in the world outside of the church. They already are. But he has to be very subtle and very strategic to deceive the church. And and, and there's an agenda that the devil has. And you say, well, maybe we should find that disconcerting. Ultimately, deception can be averted by faithful adherence to the truth of scriptures. And, and that's the key. It has been my experience, and in, 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 truthfully, I started uh, my first pastoral experience in 1982, so that is four decades. Um, wow. I was like five. Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, but it's been my experience in those last four decades of fruitful ministry, and and I'm not I don't want I'm not trying to brag, but these are things that are just true, and I need to say them. 
and, and this is where we are in the Sermon on the Mount, and the Lord's laid it on me. It's been my experience in the last four decades of fruitful ministry that false prophets don't like accountability. They despise it when I say, but Scripture says. They hate it when I say, well, let's just judge that word. Because they want to be the oracle of God without accountability to God or his word. And there's, and, I, and just so we're clear, as long as I'm here, there's no room in this church for that nonsense. We already knew that. But by saying it, it clears the air for future issues. They don't like accountability. They just want to quote scripture out of context and say God told them things. False prophets always have a personal agenda. And, and, and that's, that's the reality. I, and, and I'm just talking out of experiences. I'll talk about out of experiences here where you, you have no idea how many times because you don't get to witness these things. Uh, we'll have a church service and the Lord will anoint the worship and the Lord will anoint the sermon and God will move and people will feel him and something happens. And, and some person walks up to me that I've never seen before in my life and says, I sense God wants to do something here. And I want to say, where have you been the past 30 years when he was doing things? But what they really want is for me to give them a place to speak. Because they always have an agenda. And, and, and I'll just tell you from my experience, here's how it goes. It could happen in your life. They usually start with flattery. They start flattering me because they think I run on flattery. Flattery is not my battery, you know. And they start telling me how wonderful they think I am, and which just means they don't know me. And they just start flattering me because they think that I'll let my guard down. And let them speak. They crave and feed off of the recognition they can get because they want to be God's oracle. And they want credit for it. But they will leave destruction in their wake. And you say, how do you know that? Because they have. Because they have. And you know what I learned as a shepherd? There's nothing good about wolves. Shepherd has nothing good to say about wolves. I remember, and so you think, well, you're kind of hard on some of those guys. They're wolves. I don't like wolves. Let's get that straight. Well, how do you know so much about wolves? Because I'm a shepherd. I, I, that, that little joke about what do you call a pastor in Germany, a, a German shepherd, I, that's kind of cute. But it's also apropos for this morning because uh, one of the great shepherds are dogs. How many know that? This means yes. This, yeah. One of the great shepherds are dogs. Dogs do a great job with it, and they're bred for it. And, and, and what I learned, in, and because I'm a nut for research, what I learned in researching this was that the same instincts that wolves use to hunt, dog, sheep dogs use to preserve. All those instincts that a wolf has, a sheep dog has, but a sheepdog uses it to protect, and a wolf uses it to destroy and devour. And I remember I was reading that one day, and I was thinking about that through, and, and the Lord says, Charles, do you know the difference between a sheepdog and a wolf? When God asks you a question, you don't know the answer. I'm just telling you. The, when he asks, do you know this, you're supposed to say no because you really don't. And, and I said, uh, no. He says, sheepdog has a master. Wolves don't. Sheepdogs 
believe in accountability to someone else. Wolves don't. So that's why he writes in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets. They come to you disguised as sheep or wearing sheep's clothing, but in their hearts they are vicious wolves. In fact, a while back I read a book. It's a secular counseling book uh, because, you know, my interest in that field. But uh, in, in the secular counseling, this book was called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, and it was about people who looked like a sheep but weren't. And the, the, the point of it from a psychotherapy point of view was that you, in years past, we used to have to deal with personality disorders, you know, where people had different personality disorders and we tried to help them with it. But now, more today than ever before, the numbers of people with character disturbance are coming to the forefront. And a character disturbance is a lot different than a personality disorder. You can't help someone with a character disturbance because they'll use you to achieve their own agenda because they're a wolf, not a sheep. The things you would do to heal a sheep and help a sheep will not work on a wolf. You'll only lose a hand. And, and even as I think of that book and I think of that, that, the issue of them saying, in today's day and age, dealing with professional counseling, we, don't, we can no longer just concern ourselves with personality disorders. There are monsters among us with character disturbance that are wolves in sheep's clothing. They look human, but they have no conscience, and they will devour you. And if we aren't careful, we will never know how to set boundaries for them. And I think if that issue of character disturbance is on the rise and Jesus himself prophesied that there would be more and more false prophets in the last days, I begin to realize that this growing number of wolves in sheep's clothing is something the Lord predicted and we can document. But we want to live in the past as though that's not the case. Now, I'm a cautious guy in that regard, and I get it because, you know, and, uh, my wife is less suspicious of human beings than I am. Probably because she didn't read the Bible where, no, I'm kidding, you know, where the Bible says Jesus didn't knew what was in man. But it's actually because I've experienced monsters in my life, and she hasn't experienced those same kind of monsters. You experience a few monsters, and you begin to believe in them. So she'll say, oh, I met someone new. They seem nice. I said, they always do, honey. They always do. Right up until they wreak havoc. And you've heard me say this before. If you're in a parking garage somewhere and, and some strange man walks up to you to help you with your bags, he's not a knight in shining armor, and he's not there just trying to help lone women with their bags. He's got another agenda. Don't be foolish. And that I believe that the word charm should be viewed as a verb. When someone's pulling that stuff on you, you should say, why are you trying to charm me? Because they have a reason. And I believe that the people of this day and age need to be more wise about that than ever before. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So why would a wolf wear a sheep's clothing? Why would a wolf disguise himself as a sheep? To be close to the sheep so that he can get lunch. And that's the thing. I've found false prophets always have an agenda that is personal and will only benefit them. I have found they don't care about the health of the church. They don't care about the damage they will do to people's lives or to our body. They just want to put on their show and they have their own agenda. They want to blend in, blend in so they can cause harm. And, and, and uh, you know, back when I was superintending, I had fortunately had to remove someone who was uh, having an affair. And in the process of that, one of the parishioners said, it's not easy to lose a pastor. I said, you never did. What you lost was a sheep and wolf. It was a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
You don't lose a pastor. You, left, you lost a monster. Say, how can you say it? Because the book says it, and it's true. And until God's people become wise enough to see it, they are vulnerable. They always want to ride on the backs of someone else. They want to benefit from the labors of someone who's been faithful. They lack the fortitude to start a church and faithfully give themselves to it for years upon years. But they want to jump in and interrupt everything that's going on. Without commitment, without investment, and without accountability. And the church doesn't need that. And if that's your kind of Christianity, that's not the kind I have any interest in or ever want to be a part of. Because I've seen its damage. I've seen, I've read church history. I know where it goes. Fastest way to lose a relationship with me is this. Prophesy to me about what you think I should preach. It's over when you do that. So I'll tell a story because, you know what? I believe that adult people who are going to be Christians in this day and age need to hear every bit of the truth and understand it and comprehend it and know what life's like. So years ago, we just acquired the building, really. It hadn't been remodeled. We weren't meeting here. We had a prayer meeting in my office at the time, which is big enough for such a thing. And, and uh, some guy I'd never seen before showed up. I'm like, how do, how do these people find out that 40 people have gathered together for prayer? We don't ever put anything in the paper. We don't advertise. We don't tell anybody. How do... How do they do that? So he showed up. And it was we weren't very far in the meeting. He started pointing at one of the guys that I knew and was going to prophesy over him, and I walked between them and said, you can just stop right now. I don't know you. Why should you be prophesying over the people at this meeting? Well, well, well and I said, I don't even know but what you're a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. By the way, that offended him. Not enough. Because he stuck around. His goal was to prove to me that I was wrong. But through his immorality and his false words, he proved what he was. Until he couldn't bear it, and I just said, you need to leave. Some of you might, I had no idea. Well, you, you don't have to deal with that. But the German shepherd does. I'm not German, don't. So what do we do with these kinds of knowledges A true prophet cares about God's point of view. That's what I've learned. A true prophet cares about God's point of view from scriptures, not necessarily his own. And if you notice in the Bible, the prophets were generally the good prophets in the scriptures. They were reluctant, humble people. They weren't bullish and prideful. I love that. You know, you look at Moses. He's like, man, I just don't want to speak in public. Elijah was a recluse. And you see in so many of these guys this sincere reluctance. Even Jeremiah said, I just said I'm not going to say anything anymore. But the message of God burned within. And then you have these others that, you know, not only, hey, there's a, there's a prophecy meeting for the king. I have a prop. Let's go. Those are the most dangerous people because they feed on it. They're not interested in God's point of view. They're interested in what they get out of it that moment. And so Jesus, very wisely, as only God can be, 
says simply, by their fruit you will know them. And, and, and I, of course, agree with that. The, the issue I have is people don't know what fruit to look for anymore. Because they'll say, well, well how could that be? They seem, they seem so nice. Did they now? Well, that, that, that person, I didn't expect them to be. They seem so nice. Oh, so they looked like a sheep, did they? How does a wolf act when it's disguised as a sheep? You ever watch a sheepdog work? When the sheep are going the wrong direction? They're liable to get some teeth in their haunch. The sheep don't always think the sheepdog's so nice. You get the point. But the sheepdog is protecting them. And, of course, so if we look at that, we know there's this issue of, you know, well, if the prophecy doesn't come true, then it's false prophecy, and they'd be, any guess is what you'd call a false prophecy someone that tells a false prophecy, false prophet. There we go. That was hard. (laughs) Jeremiah 14, 14 says, the Lord says this, then the Lord told me, these are the lies that the prophets are telling in my name. They claim that I have sent them, commanded them, spoke to them. They dreamed up the vision. They tell you their predictions are worthless. They are the products of their own imagination. Wow, you wouldn't want that scripture describing you. In the Old Testament, if someone prophesied falsely, it was an easy solution. You cut down on false prophets because they would be put to death. Nowadays, we just say, well, better luck next time. I'm not advocating capital punishment for false prophets. Um, But I'll tell you, They have way too much latitude in the body of Christ. The greatest falsity that comes out of the mouth of a false prophet is, God told me, when it didn't really happen. From that point on, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter how true it is or untrue it is. They have already lied if what they said wasn't inspired by God himself. And according to Revelation, all liars have their place in the lake of fire. Isn't it easy, though? We just add a thus saith the Lord or God said or God told me to anything we want to prove our point. You could do that with this sermon. Charles is wrong. You know, thus saith the Lord. Say, where do you come up with this stuff, Charles? I grew up in Pentecostalism. I pastor Pentecostal church. I've seen enough to know how to come about this. Oh, you should, you should marry him, thus saith the Lord. You know how many people I've counseled when I was doing counseling that got married because someone gave a thus saith the Lord to that? Quit your job, thus saith the Lord. And people flippantly and without reverence, without respect, without honor towards God himself who would speak the voice to the ear of the person who would hear, they just add a thus saith the Lord whenever they feel like they're emotionally involved and want to prove their point. God told me to do this. God told me to do that. It's absurd. I had a gal, God told me to come to this church, okay. God told me to leave this church. God told me to come back. God told me to leave. God told me to come back. One day I said, wow, God's really fickle. Either God's fickle or you don't ever hear from him. God told her to leave after that. We can chuckle, but it, the problem is, the problem is, 
It's abundantly dangerous in our Christian culture today with its prevalency. You know that it's possible for a false prophet to predict true things and still be a false prophet? It's in the Bible. Deuteronomy 13.1, one of your people claiming to be a prophet or to have prophetic dreams may predict a miraculous sign or amazing thing. What he predicts may even take place. But don't listen to that prophet or dreamer if he says, let's worship and serve other gods. Those gods may be gods you've never heard of. The Lord your God is testing you to find out if you really love him with all your heart. And here we see that people can actually make true predictions to lead others astray. And I will submit this to you. You say, well, in our day and age in the Christian church, someone's not going to use a false prophecy to tell you to not be a Christian. No. But they'll use it to trick you so that you don't follow the Scripture, the very Word of God himself. You know, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, I'm concerned about you. He had good reason to be concerned about the Corinthian church. He writes, I am concerned about you. That if some other person came proclaiming some other spirit or some other Christ, you would follow them. And it happens inside of Christianity all the time. So much of what gets the label Christian isn't even that. It's not even in the remotely biblical. But we give it that name. You know, you know what taking the names, you know, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. That's a commandment. And that's not just about using his name as a swear word. If you take his name and attach it to something that's not from him, you have taken his name in vain. When someone says, thus saith the Lord, and it wasn't the Lord, they have broken that commandment. When someone puts a cross or a fish on their business card to get more money and they're not really a very good Christian, they have taken the Lord's name in vain. They have attached with vanity God's name to things that God's not himself attached to. So, you know, they can give accurate words, but be immoral. They can give accurate words, but lead you away from the truth of Scripture. uh, You know that uh, prophets that cause discord in the body of Christ are immoral because it's immoral to cause discord in the body of Christ? You know, God hates that. He hates it when people cause church splits. It's immoral. So you can't do that in the name of the Lord. Because Christ wants unity and the Holy Spirit labors to bring it about. And, and so if Jesus, we come to this, if Jesus warns so severely about it, then we must discuss it. And that's how we wrap this up. We must discuss it. By discuss it, I mean I'm talking to you and you're hearing me. So it's a lot like home. Um, I mean, that's, I was blaming myself there, guys. Uh, In 2020, in 2020, a lot of famous prophets, famous prophets prophesied that Donald Trump would never leave office. I think we have two years of evidence to prove them wrong. Two years have gone by. And most of them never recanted and never apologized for their false prophecy. And by the way, what does that make them? And, and one of them I, had, I, I have some respect for because he repented, said he was wrong, and that he and the others have shamed the body of Christ and that every one of them should apologize. That I can respect. 
That's an act of integrity. <laughs> you say, well, why would you bring that up? Because it's time to look at that and call it what it is. Those are wolves in sheep's clothing. We as people of God wouldn't want to get sucked in. And, and of course, you know, the very natural thing, just as a pastor of Toledo Foursquare, I would say something along the lines of, let those kooks ruin some other church, not this one. I don't really mean that to full detail, though, because it makes me angry when they ruin other ones. But I will say not here. But my heart is broken over the churches that are being destroyed because of the malicious actions of people who say they hear from God. And they clearly don't or they wouldn't be sowing seeds of discord. We have to learn to humbly walk with God and let, you know, and you say, well, don't, doesn't everyone have a right to believe what they, yes, everyone has a privilege. I don't know that it's a right, but it's certainly a privilege to believe the way they'd like. And they have the right to the consequences of their beliefs. People can have the privilege to follow after false proclaimers. And they have the right to reap the fruit of that seed. I wouldn't want to be one of those people. And I wouldn't want that for you. And then I, I heard this statement. It's a great statement. I wasn't going to tell you where I got it because it's, it's such a good statement and it's so full of depth. Um, but, you know, it's a good statement and it's this. Don't judge God by the people that say they worship him. Isn't that a good statement? Indian scout on wagon train said it. Just saying. That doesn't mean you could give up your Bible for wagon train. I was watching Wagon Train and the Indian Scout, he said that, and I went, hey, I like that. So, you know, I didn't want to tell you where I got it because, you know, that's not exactly deep, but uh, let's bow our heads. Lord, we need you like we have never needed you, and yet we've always needed you the same. It's so strange to us that in these last days we see the perilous times around us. We see the deceptions of man. We see how easily people are drawn astray. We can even begin to witness the separating of sheep and goats, Lord. And we want to be on your right hand, Lord Jesus. We want to follow your scripture and adhere to it and, and preserve us from danger, preserve us from wrong. And even when we sin and fall short of the mark, may we come to you for, with true repentance and humility, Lord. And I pray a hedge of protection around uh, the hearts and lives that are represented today in this church. From, from the, the genuine work of the devil in the arena of false prophecy whereby he seeks out to destroy. And Lord, that we would not grow skilled at judging others, but skilled at following Jesus. In your holy name, amen. Well, thank you. See you next time, maybe.